take your seats. We're going to move into our Tuesday, July 13th, 2010, 530 Committee of the Whole meeting. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Councilman Burgess? Here. Councilwoman Lovis? Here. Councilman Maldonado? Here. Councilman Shelley? Here. Councilman Williams? Here. Vice Mayor Warman? Here. Mayor Bateman? Here. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Additions, deletions, deferrals. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, I'd like to pull item 6C. C. Okay. Okay. Consider item 6C pulled. What I'd like to do, with permission from my fellow council, is I'd like to move Park and Recs up up now to the front as Mrs. Wallman may have to leave early. So if we could, if there's no objections, I'd like to start item A. Say, is there any objections? Okay. Let's move forward in tab 7. Let's flip to tab 7. And the first item, I'll entertain a motion. It's a bid 200830 William F. Dickinson Community Center change orders. A motion to move it forward to discuss. I'll move it forward, Mayor. Thank you. Second? Second. Okay. Staff report. Tell us about these change orders. Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, what you have before you is a follow-up, if you will, to an action that you previously adopted. Back in April 19 of this year, we brought you a number of budget amendments. Contained within those amendments, there was an estimated number that we allocated for park, that were related to park, to the Parks and Recreation Department. And what we're doing tonight is a follow-up to that. We discussed that at the time, I went into some detail as to some of the improvements that we needed to make. Improvements that were necessary to the community center. Specifically, if you recall, we had, we went to some detail in the conversation where we, where I brought up to your attention that the telephone service was not, the telephone system was not built in the... There was no telephone system. There wasn't a telephone system. And the plans, there were issues concerning the ceiling, the plumbing, and a number of other items that are all listed there that were missing from the project. We estimated that budget amendment at the time was an estimate of about $150,000, if I remember correctly. And there's the list of all the things that were needed in the building to make it actually... Some of which are, I mean, we needed because otherwise we would not have passed the fire inspection and obtained an occupancy certificate. So the list is there. And we were able to lower the amount, and this is why it's before you, to 100, I believe it's 138? $39,411.52. And it's, the funding source is from, going to be taken from the impact fees. Just a quick question without going into each item, because there's quite a few of them there. Tell me, I'm sorry, you wouldn't, would be actually, maybe Julio can answer this because you weren't here. What was the, what was the thinking? Did they actually think that they were saving money by not pre-wiring a building for alarm, phones, and internet? Did somebody really think they were saving money? Well, at the time, and I can only try to think of where it came from, but the idea was, the way I understand it, is that the city would use city crews to do those installations instead of using a contractor and thereby saving money to do that. That was the thinking behind it. But of course, we all know what really happened, and 
how that doesn't work. But that, I think, was the reasoning behind it. Well, I can go along with that. And if we have people that talented to do that, I agree. But how did the drywall get put on? How did the insulation get put in? How did the drywall get put on? How did the drywall get finished without any of that stuff put behind the walls? Correct. No, I'm in full agreement with you. I mean, I'm the one that pushed for this to be done. I'm not here, but I'm just curious, and I figured if anybody can answer it, you could tell me. Exactly. And those decisions were made prior to me getting involved in the project. So when I ran into them, it was a surprise for us as well. It was a surprise. I don't want to beat it to that, but it just amazes me that somebody thought that's a money saver. That's not a money saver. It was a surprise for us as well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, last one. In the past, there's been a lot of discussion about change orders. But when you cut the fat from something, you can't cut the telephone lines. You can't cut the computers. You can't cut the steel in the roof. You can't cut, you know, the drywall. There's many things you can't cut. So I think that's what happened, and I just want to make it very clear that I think our crew, our group, did an excellent job with what they had to work with. And as Julio said, it came as a great surprise to him, as it was a great surprise to me when I walked in and there were no telephone jacks and no computer jacks or anything else. So, Mayor, I think that's what happened. Thank you, ma'am. Questions from counsel? Just my one concern that I've expressed every time we've done these type of things is I would rather find out as we go along at $10,000, $20,000, keep a total running, instead of finding out that we're $150,000, $160,000, $139,000, as tonight shows in the future when we're doing these jobs. I'd much rather have an accountability as we go along, either monthly or quarterly, whatever, however long the project's going to be worked out. There's another project that I already found some infrastructure-type improvements that I'll be forthcoming to you to advise you on, and that is the Roscoe Warren Park, things that I think are beneficial to do up front now instead of having to come back later and tearing up what we did to do stuff that should really take place now, logistically. May I answer the chair? Sure, please. I just wanted to answer Mr. Burgess. I can't agree with you more. This came as a total surprise to our Parks and Recs director and to, I'm not trying to speak for you, Julio, but I think it came as a huge surprise to you as well when we got to the nitty-gritty of it all. So thank you, though. Thank you. Any further discussion from counsel? Okay. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Any nays? Motion carries. Next item, item B, installation of shuffleboard courts. Actually, I'm doing your job tonight, city attorney. Go ahead. Vice mayor. You're doing a good job. Go ahead. I'll make the motion. Go ahead. Yeah, installation of shuffleboard courts, shade structures, and golf putting greens. Well, that sounds nice. I'll make a motion. Motion to move it. Second? Second. Thank you. Staff report. Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of the city council, I can only say here that this is coming to you by popular demand. This, especially the shuffleboard, it's part of what that park has been historically. Once they were gone, everybody wanted to see him back there. We're taking this opportunity to bring the whole concept a notch or two up by providing the putting green, which we anticipate is going to have a lot of use. And, you know, the shade structures will also be heavily used because it's very hot out there. So it's going to be an improved shuffleboard court with the option of a nearby putting green. It's going to be very nice. Yes, Vice Mayor, go ahead. I just wanted to say that this is grant money, and Dennis and his wisdom with his staff, they picked out all these wonderful things, and it will, like our manager said, have shade. The shuffleboard goes back, we reminisce back to Muzzle White Park and why that was created in the first place, and that was because of the shuffleboard, and they will be state-of-the-art. There's not only a putting green, but there's a, hey, Dennis, help me, there's a chipping and a sand trap, right? Correct. So we're hoping that not only will that enhance the adult, we were thinking about the men, because 
you know, they were complaining they didn't have anything to do. So, so not only will that enhance that, but there's also a lot of teens, because it is a community center that likes to play golf, and they can go over there and do that. So that's how that all came about. And it is grant money, as you mentioned. And it is grant money. And I just have one more thing under parks sure. and recs. Sure. Um, can, can I oh, just... Oh, we need a vote on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just real quick on it. Um, I, I, too, as well, when I uh, saw that the... the when the community center opened, I was what was the shuffleboard? So I'm very, very happy to see this come about. The only question I would have is, uh, I've heard mentioned in the past, it's great when we build something and we have a, uh, we got money from from a grant, and and obviously I'm in favor for it. My only concern is, are we gonna do we have to have a, some type of line item budget for the maintenance of this, or is that just already going to be covered just through normal? Uh, whoever's in charge of the, of the community center, that's going to be added to their to-do list. And uh, exactly. if there's any maintenance to be done on it, where is that money going to come out of? It, it's and just for future reference, you know, it's great, but... We, we already maintain the grounds. Uh, shuffleboard will be minimal maintenance, uh, and the, the installation comes with a warranty uh, of the uh, potting green, and, and, and so it's... It, it's ambition to be as part of the uh, regular operation. Right. If there's any, if there's any, uh, you know, after you kind of build it and put it up there, and if there's any maintenance that they could, uh, tips that they could give us for our staff to be able to manage it the proper way, that would of be course. great. If it, I mean, it'd be, you know, I don't want them to just come in here, build it, and then say, okay, see you later. If they could actually give us the tips to maintain it, might not be much, but whatever we can do to make, sure we, make yeah, the best of it. Thank you. Mr. Williams, did you want to no. Okay. All right. Any any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays. Motion carries. Just one more thing. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I'm very happy and pleased to announce tonight that the groundbreaking for Roscoe Warren Park will be um, Friday morning at 10:30. Um, we have a, a time. Um, line that we're trying to meet because we have Joby dollars so we're pushing it forward and we're going to do the uh, groundbreaking at 1030 we hope all of you can come out and be there with us um, we'll have the tents up and we'll have uh, refreshments for you but it's really a historical day and we waited a long time to to uh, shovel some dirt there and I'm um, very excited about it and we're good with everything aren't we Sergio yes, we everything is good no no problems we're moving. All right, Mayor. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I have to leave. I have a little family emergency, so. Thank you so much. All right, um, let's move back to the front page there to uh, Committee of the Whole uh, Minutes, June 8, 2010. Mm -hmm. Order. Minutes. Thank you, sir. Second. second thank you. Uh, questions, comments? No questions and comments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Item carries. Next item would be continued discussion of Homestead Air Force Airport Zoning Ordinance. Excuse me. Entertain and a motion to move that forward. Move it. Thank I, you. I would, Second. I would rather take care of our business real quick. I don't think we got stuff that's going to take and, and okay. then take care of that at the end if we could. Does anybody want? Would you want to take care of the business first? Uh, yes, sir, man. I okay. think that's a great you, idea. You got it. All right. Then let's move. Uh, turn the page. We'll move. Um, item C uh, would be the tab two tolling agreement between Michael Ladner and the City of Homestead. Entertain a motion to move it. So moved, Mayor. Second. Second. Okay, staff report. Can we address that? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, very briefly, uh, this item will enable the uh, city and the uh, Latner folks to have an opportunity to try to work out the uh, pending litigation that concerns the 1993 agreement. It will basically put uh, that litigation uh, on hold uh, and request the court to uh, abate the proceedings, but toll or hold in place uh, any rights uh, that exist, if any, during this uh, two-year tolling period. So it's, uh, as it's recited in here, it's fair to both parties in that it tries to avoid uh, further expenditures of uh, fees and costs uh, on this matter to give the parties a chance to try to work out uh, an uh, amicable uh, settlement of the matter. Okay, questions from Council? Council? <coughs> questions? I got a question. Yes. Um, and the last, what you just said, where there was going to be maybe a time that we could, they could, uh, we, the city, and, and uh, with uh, the Lander Group, be able to work on this. I see here that there is a period of six months from entry in any order of abatement. 
disenable parties to avoid cost litigation and so on and so on. Are we going to be working within that time frame to maybe try to see if we can work something out? That's correct, right. We'll be trying to work with them to, you know, resolve this matter. And it has a provision that if the parties can't work things out, they will proceed to a mediation before either party ever files a suit in the future. But the parties will move together for a hold in the litigation and will try to work together to resolve the matter. Okay. So we only have a six-month period to be working on that. My question would be maybe through the chair to the city manager who would be working on that. It says that we're going to be working on it. So my question is who's working on it. If I may. I'll take your direction on that. If you like, I would. Excuse me. I understand what the tolling is that we're putting on the hold. To answer that, the resolution in Section 3 authorizes the city manager to take any action necessary to implement this tolling agreement and the resolution. So we would work together with the manager as he feels necessary. Okay. And just to add some clarification. Mr. Shelley, that was part of trying to sell this 93 agreement or working on a settlement for this 93 agreement. You guys had placed or asked me to take the lead as far as negotiations. That is still going on. I am still waiting for a response from the other side as far as what they would like and working on negotiations. And so I am on the process of seeing what can be worked out within that six-month period, if anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. Mr. Manager, did you not say that maybe you already made that comment that you wanted to sit down with on the tolling agreement? Did you not say that you wanted to have a discussion? No, that was another matter that I asked. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion before we vote? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays? The motion carries. Next item. This is an increase preferential treatment. It's one of my favorites. I go back to 1995 on this. And in 1995, we approved the 10 percent somehow from 95. So now I got moved back to 5 percent for local businesses. So I made a motion to move forward. Move it. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Staff report? Mr. Mayor, basically that's what he does. He changes the current code from a 5 percent preference of local vendors to a 10 percent so that we give more weight to our local subcontractors and subcontractors. Now, does the body of this ordinance, does it allow for a certain time amount to be a local? I mean, just so for the public, you know, what does the actual body of this thing read? Does it read that tomorrow they're a local and tomorrow they move in and pull a business license and that they fall under the guidelines of 10 percent? As defined by the code, you know, the local vendors will have that weight when they submit for bid. Local vendor? What's the definition of a local vendor? We recently addressed that in one of our negotiations with the charter school. And I believe the local vendor has to be registered with the city, has to be within city limits. And I don't recall any stipulation as to the amount of time that has to be, has to have reside within the city, the business itself. I'm asking. Just to further add to that, the current ordinance is a simple change that takes the 5 percent local preference and changes it to 10 percent. It doesn't change the existing test for a local business, which is that they are the holder of a current local business tax receipt. That's the formerly known as the occupational license, now called local business tax receipt. If you wanted to make any further standards, you could, but that would require an amendment to this. Okay. I think for now it's fine. I just really never got an answer from you. Any further questions from counsel? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any nays? Motion carries. 5 percent to 10 percent. Okay. Next item, finance, purchase service equipment for manhole rehabilitation, tab 4. Entertain a motion to move it forward. Move it. Second. Second. Thank you. Staff report. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, this is basically um, to refurbish the old manholes that we have. They're all brick, uh, that, and you know the, the purpose is to stop the infiltration into our system. Um, and, and obviously, when you have that kind of problem, it reduces the, the, the flow uh, in the overall sewer treatment plan. So this is. This is a um, uh, expenditure comes from the enterprise fund, and it's uh, using a $51,000 part of a, a matching EPA grant. Uh, we get approximately uh, on a yearly basis. We set aside um, between this fund and a couple of others. Uh, this fund we set aside for this type of project about 200,000, and then a couple of others add up to be about $300,000 on a yearly basis to solve problems like this. Um, and uh, that's basically what it is. It's just uh, to, to fix the, the manhole, old manhole uh, uh, locations that we have throughout the city. Okay. Mr. Williams? Uh, how many manholes? Are there? Um. Mayor, Council, uh, 50 manholes. 50, 50? 4. 48 inch. Diameter brick precast manholes uh, throughout the city. Just to, just to piggyback off of what Councilman Williams said, how many do we have throughout the city? Would be was my question. Do you guys have a count for that? And and on top of that, uh, how many times is this going to occur? Um, you know, maybe the last time. I think I looked the last time that might happen was to be 1991. When we last time we worked on the manhole cover, so I know it'll be a while before we do it again. But as I was just reading through that, just one of the questions that popped in my head: how many manholes? And uh, you know, that'd be it on that one. You, you don't have to put that data now. When you get a chance, just for future reference. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're reading here. I got info. <laughs> Yeah. We have a count of those. We have a count. And, and really what we try to do is we try to do a certain amount every year. And uh, these are as a result of inspections that we do in the manholes. So the manholes that are being repaired are the ones that are in the worst case at that time. Um, again, like, like uh, Sergio was saying, the idea is to minimize the amount of clean water going into our sewer lines and thereby taking away capacity from, our tr from the actual treatment plant that is set aside for treating sewage, not not clean water. So, mm -hmm. thank you, sir. Uh, Any further questions? Good information. I need to know that. We'll, we'll give you the, the total that we estimate. That's fine. Any further questions? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays. Item carries. Uh, B. S C A D A software upgrade. Motion to move. Thank you. Second. Second. Staff report. Yes, sir. This is a software that we use to monitor and control uh, the electric grid within the city. Uh, the software we currently have will now be supported uh, within a year. Uh, so we, at this point, we estimate that we'll save about $8,000 if we do this now. Um, we are recommending that, that, we, that you go ahead and approve it. It's, it's a vital part in our monitoring system for the electric utilities department. Thank you. Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays? Item carries. Uh, next item, commissioning and startup of diesel generator E21. Motion to move it forward? Thank you. Mr. Shelley, second? Thank you. Um, staff report. Um, this uh, this is the last of three generators that needed to be upgraded uh, and with an automatic control uh, to place the, the loads online with the uh, and, and while meeting with all the uh, regulatory agencies requirements. Um, if we don't do this, uh, we, we're, we're risking having to go and, and buy power, you know, at a higher cost. So it's the last it's the last one of the three engines that we need to fix and I'm recommending that that we move on with this. Mayor, just had a question. I mean from reading this it seems like it's already been fixed, right? This is just to actually turn it on and do the do the software, is that correct? Or is this the actual fixing? You mean this to the chair, right? 
through the chair. Oh, okay. Okay. That's the However, that's the procedure. <laughs> Answer the question. I'm going to go forward with the, with the director. Yes, this is for the commissioning and the startup. Okay. That's correct. So it's already, it's, it's, it's in working order. It's been repaired. We put the money into that. And at this point, it's just kind of the odds. It's, it's, right? been, it's been upgraded, but um, there, are, there are some um, computer programming aspects that need to be taken care of at this point. Okay. Perfect. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Williams, you were trying to ask something? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, uh, more so about... Um, I, I heard the manager through the chair say um, that if if we don't do this, then we will have to buy power from others at a higher rate. Could you explain that through the chair, please? Uh, my understanding, and feel free to jump in at any moment, you're the expert on this. My understanding is that if you don't have the power generation sufficient, uh, if we need additional power, uh, that, then we will have to go out and buy uh, at, a, at a higher price. Whereas if we had the engine running, we will be experiencing savings in, in that generation of power. No. Roger. Another question to the chair? Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, while we're there, um, uh, when does the other 6% of savings kick in? <laughs> Since we're just on the electrical department. Poor thing, see? <laughs> Good question. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. If, if I was going to defer to the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, she's deferring to the mayor because we had this discussion yesterday. Oh. And, um, and uh, we are in the middle of uh, putting out a press release now with um, the numbers that came from your department and with the um, public information officer. She has wrote um, a very nice release that's going to go out hopefully Friday's paper, um, which uh, I believe the total was 11.3, 11.3 yeah, in total, Mr. I believe, Williams. I believe it was a 5% uh, decrease, right? Yeah, correct. The, the current decrease is, is 5%. The, the one that uh, was put in place in January was 6.6, uh, .6, I believe. Mm -hmm. The total decrease is 11.3%. Mm -hmm. so. See, okay. I didn't put him up to that either. So, <laughs> uh, through the chair. Yes, sir. So when, then? And my first question. Will be it is in place. Oh, it is already? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. I was surprised, but that's, I'm happy it's in place, and we're going to let the public know. Anything further? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Any nays? Item carries. Okay. Um, skip the uh, parking racks. Public safety. Uh, traffic signal installation at Pornofino Plaza entrance modification. Southwest 312th Street and 157th Avenue. Entertain, entertain a motion to move it. Thank you. Second. Second. Staff report. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, this is a project that was estimated originally at a cost of $129,066.09 with nine cents, um, based on anticipated uh, the anticipated value of the materials to be used. Um, after we scoped out the project, uh, that estimate uh, appeared to be uh, on the sh sh on short uh, by $24,918.48, uh, which actually reflects the, the actual uh, materials cost that it would, co it, would, it, it would take to complete the project. Um, and it's based on the um, standards set out by, by Miami-Dade County. So in order to complete the project up to those standards, we needed the additional uh, 24000 And And the funding mechanism is PPP money, People's Transportation uh, Plan. So. Thank you, sir. Question to the council? Yeah. Yes, Thanks, Mr. Williams. Uh, to the chair, uh, to the manager. Um, so then whose calculations was off was the company that we... I, I asked that question uh, yeah. and I, I didn't get an answer earlier. Oh, uh, maybe we can get one now. Maybe we can. Um, Julio? Do the chair. Uh, 
through the chair. Um, the way these projects work, uh, basically we're piggybacking on a county contract, which is based on unit pricing for qu certain quantities. The quantities are based on standard uh, installations for traffic signals, and the way the county runs this program is they, they put a base price, basically, on what a traffic signal will, will a traffic signal installation will cost. And they, we keep track along with the county as to the quantities that are used, that are actually used. And all this is is basically just taking the actual quantities and using the pre-approved unit pricing for those quantities to come up with the actual cost of the project. Uh, the reason the county does this is they're basically, they have two contractors that do traffic signal installations throughout the county. And, um, it's such a large number of traffic signals. This way they can move them forward at a faster pace than actually going out and, and doing a very detailed uh, cost estimate up front. This way they know they have a menu of pricing that they, that they can follow. And then at the end, it can either be up or down, you know, based on what was actually used in that particular installation. Um, Mayor through the chair. Yes, that's right. So, in anticipation, uh, this is something that uh, we knew up front. But when doing this, doing this project, we knew that at that point we had you had to come back to get more money. Either more or less. I mean, we. This is a unit price. It's a unit price. Uh, how you get based contract? Money? How do you get less money? You mean they owe, owe us? <laughs> if after the job is completed, less materials than what was anticipated is used, then there is less money spent on the project. Yes, than what was actually okay. anticipated at the beginning. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, sir. Any further questions? All in favor? All right. Uh, any nays? Motion carries. The next item, this is uh, a Calvin Gordino Associates. Uh, this is a for emergency management consulting service. Entertain a motion. Move it. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, staff report. Uh, yes, sir. Um, uh, Calvin Giordano and Associates, Inc. Uh, were selected uh, to provide this, this type of professional services. Uh, they will review our comprehensive emergency management plan. They will write uh, a continuity and operation plan uh, for the city, uh, and, and they will work with uh, our EOC, uh, Emergency Operations Center, uh, hand in hand uh, when it comes to you know th these plans. Um, the funding comes from get this right, uh, a, what is called a UAC uh, spending. Uh, plan is a grant. It's UASI spending plan, um, and, and as I said, that is a grant, uh, and it's the uh, Carbon Giordano will not exceed that amount. There, that's part of you know the scope of work. Thank you, sir. Questions uh, from Through council? Chair. Yes. yes. What um, what do they do different than what we've hired uh, retired Captain Ed Bo to do? They are. I thought that he came in and was our EOC guy to set up all our programs, uh, take care of them, administer them, blah 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 blah. He's the coordinator, and <clears throat> and we discussed this, uh, and because he feels that it is a conflict, that he works for the city, and he applied for this grant, that he had a problem with an ethical, an ethical problem uh, also. Um, getting paid by this grant that he applied for. And he felt that uh, the most ethical way was to hire a an outside firm to help us with the expenditure. God bless him. He's a very he's ethical man. Straight through guy. Yeah. 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 No, no question. Any further, Mr. Burgess? Further from council? Uh, just, I, one, just one question. Oh, so, um, through the chair, um, then in, in that case, um, the monies that were applied for uh, from this grant that you just, whatever acronym that was, um, this is in addition to what we're already paying for consulting services for. Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. And 
And and they have uh, they will come in and then do what? And do, uh, do those plans that were outlined that I mentioned earlier. So they will work. It will. My question is: Will Ed Bob still be handling what we are hiring these will, persons to yes. do, or is it just um, you know uh, understand the ethical reason for applying for um, and not? Mr. Bob will continue to do his job as a DOC coordinator for the city. Uh, they were hired to um, write the plan, the, the two different plans, and to coordinate some of the emergency operations center uh, operations that we that we, you know, normally conduct. But uh, yes, Mr. Bo will continue to do that. He just felt that because he applied for the grant, he felt again that it was somewhat unethical on his part to also get paid by it. And, and, and do it. Uh, Carbon Giordano has done this work before and they have a proven track record. Uh, if you recall, they were also used by the city in the past uh, for transportation type uh, review projects. So. I, I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, what, I just don't understand. I mean, we, we have persons writing grants all the time and, and you know, they, it's part of what the administrative costs or what have you. Um, I just don't see why th that will be a conflict. Uh, we do the, here at the city, and you know, and other grants uh, are done all the time. What, what is the com What is the conflict? If I'm not following, and maybe it's just me, but I just don't get maybe it. Maybe through the chair. I, I I understand your your concern, and and if you like, if it's a wish of this council. I, uh, uh, I think it may be worth it for me to go call the the, the grant, the the funding source, and and ask them directly if they will have an issue if our uh, the, the person that applied for the grant, who happens to be our Employee. emergency operations coordinator, will Employee. would would act, uh, the fact that if he if he would perform these duties, this uh, this uh, tasks that would be in conflict with any of the guidelines and and the grant. If not, then I'll come back to you and, and give you a report. Now, based on my, I asked the question because I'm trying to save money as much as I can, you know, and this is, you know, a contract that, that's basically out of the general fund and I'm seeking for grants to pay for his salary for, for, the, for the contract. No, so, uh, but he, that was his reply and that he felt very uncomfortable by doing so uh, in order to satisfy your I mean, to answer your inquiry, I'll, I'll, if you may, if you, if it's your general consent, I would like to go back and, and ask directly the, the grant source. Okay. Um. Th thank you, Mayor. I, I just don't see uh, maybe you know the attorneys could provide some light, but I. Mayor, I, I would. Uh, Mr. Maldonado, yes. Thank the you, Mayor. Then the, then through the, the chair um, uh, to the city manager, then, and then maybe we should with with that in mind, since we don't have a better a good explanation on it. Please do. I would also, um, rec you know, recommend what you just said in the sense of can we, can we find out about that, and, um, and if we could, maybe we could defer this until we, we get that uh, answer that okay. question. Second thing before that, is there a timeline for the grant to make sure that we're not losing out on it? Um, it's something that, that I would like to know as well. That would be one of my questions right now. Is there a time frame for this if we're going to? Look to defer this or, or table it. Let's hear from the city attorney, maybe. Uh, Mayor, after reading this material, it looks to me <laughs> like you really do not need to defer this because the, the work that's described in here uh, is really supplementary to the day-to-day -day work of uh, former Captain Bo. Just reading it, it requires various technical reports to be created, and this entity, uh, Calvin Giordano, in their material backup materials. Uh, basically says they've done this work for other communities. So it's really supplementary to the work of uh, retired Captain Bo in his consultant capacity. So, But it's up to you, naturally, whether you defer it for more information, but I really see it as two different types of work. Captain Bo is the day-to-day -day type work, uh, whereas this entity involves uh, various plans that have to be created uh, and or updated. Ms. Lobos. Thank you, Mayor. Then if that was the case, I would think that Captain Bo would have stated that that 
was the reason perhaps why the grant would yeah. be needed and this additional consultants would be brought on that Captain Bo would have said this is really supplemental outside of what my scope day to day would be, not the ethical conflict of having written the grant and then accepting it. Did he mention anything about it being outside of his day to day duties would be the question to the city manager through the mayor. Thank you. His reply was, as I stated, that he felt uncomfortable and that it wasn't ethical Perfect. if he, uh, you know, took the money and, and, and performed those duties uh, because he applied for the grant. Um, my recommendation, and, and as a manager, uh, I, I recognize the, 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 the point that Councilman Williams is making, and I think uh, is is worth looking into it. And and I agree. Uh, if you all agree, I would rather go back and ask directly the grant source. And and if they don't have an issue with this, I don't have a problem adding those additional duties to to Catembo's, uh you know, responsibilities. Mr. Mayor, thank you. One second, Mr. Burgess. Well, just to through the chair to piggyback along that. I see that this grant was done back in January. That's one that's before Captain Bo was hired on to do the specific job that we've since hired him on. So this grant was, was done long before, three or four months before we brought him in. Yes. And I, I go along with the same train of thought that I thought that his scope of services that we were hiring him for would cover pretty much what we're doing here. They could. And I, and I went through that with him. He just felt uncomfortable, as I mentioned. Uh, and I can add uh, those additional duties to to his, you know, responsibilities. It's just that, uh, again, he, 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 his response was. Uh, I, under, I understand him, but I think in today's times of, of economic tough times that we're all facing is a, is a thing. If, if thirty thousand dollars that takes care of a large chunk of the salary that we've I given agree. this man for a year, so I would definitely like to see us go back before we award this. Mm -hmm. go back and see if we can work that grant to pay him and if his scope of work can fulfill what he's trying to do with this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shelley. Yes, uh, the same, same thing to echo Mr. Williams and also um, Councilman Burgess's, and that is, you know, if it's him personally saying that he doesn't want to make that decision himself, but if we as a council say we, we have the confidence, we're going to relieve you of that burden and we're going to say you're going to do a good job, then I think that's the, the method we should go, especially if it saves us money as a city. Yes, so I agree with everyone else. I think we maybe look into this a little bit more before we, we move forward. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, at this point, um, we're going to defer it. We need, uh, we need a, a motion yeah, to I'll, defer I'll move to defer it. Okay. Motion to defer. Second. Second it. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? The okay, motion carries. Next item. Uh, amendment um, of agreement between American uh, Traffic Solutions, ATS, and the City of Homestead. Motion to move. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Um, Staff report. I'll, I'll open it up and I, then I turn it over to, to the City Attorney. You might want to add uh, the bulk of it. At, um, but what this does, in, in essence, is that it brings the, the current agreement uh, into compliance with the, with the state legislature that just got approved. And, and we, went, we went through some of that uh, at the last hearing. Um, you have any, there may be, uh, according to the attorney, there may be some additional changes that may be forthcoming. Um, that's, that's correct. Prior to the uh, approval of the agreement at the next regular council meeting, we will likely be providing a revised version because we've had some contact with the ATS company uh, yesterday and today advising of certain revisions uh, that they would like to make. They previously uh, had not uh, fully signed off on the revised agreement and therefore they've, they've given these revisions. So we'll be providing to you uh, those revisions that uh, are appropriate. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Williams. So does that mean, uh, through the chair, does that mean to the attorney or manager, does that mean then then we don't need to discuss this until, the, until you bring back the final product? But that's fine. At your choice, you could either discuss it tonight if you had any questions or concerns and uh, discuss it further at the regular council meeting or just await the final agreement. Uh, it's really these changes are not very significant, but there will be some uh, wordings of the paragraphs uh, uh, that will change because uh, of the comments that we've received from ATS. 
All right. Now, this, this is uh, through chair. Um, this is a uh, something that has been done by the state of Florida through a, 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 a the process of policy making. So, what more uh, arrangements will ATS have? Because right. this is not uh, uh, anything that will be different. That's correct. What right. Basically, we already have a successful program with ATS, but because of the new law that took effect July one, certain changes have to be made to uh, follow the, that new law, because the new law changed some of the procedures. For example, instead of using the code enforcement system for these red light camera violations, the county court system will be involved. Once a person fails to pay a notice of violation, an actual uniform traffic uh, ticket citation will be issued, and that goes to the county court. So that changes some of the uh, framework. And so the, basically the agreement would be uh, further revised to uh, comply with that new statutory framework. So, um, Mayor, yes, uh, the Chair, uh, then uh, I would feel comfortable then you bringing back the complete packet to the Council before we can discuss or, or vote on then for, so that we all have a full understanding because if it doesn't, this, this is not an ordinance, it's just, just a what resolution. So this is once it's done and be put on the consent agenda. Correct. So I would rather uh, at another meeting or so that you bring back a, the, whatever the arrangements are that you've gotten uh, so that we can be fully uh, voting on this with uh, a surety and uh, intelligently with all the information. And we were moving forward with that uh, understanding. It's just that they added some additional, right. they that's had correct. some additional concerns in the last few hours and that's why the attorney has brought it up to your attention. Well, is it the pleasure? Yes. I have a question. Sure. The meat or the heart of the legislation that just passed was the revenue sharing portion of it, right. and where the state is now going to take a portion of the revenue that comes in. Where is that going to be reflective on an agreement with ATS, on something with the county? Do you know already, like, where that's going to right. be reflective? The, right. The parties will follow that funding formula or the division of revenue formula that the state created. One of the changes to the uh, agreement that the state required is that uh, ATS cannot be paid on the amount of violations or number of violations. Instead, a flat fee approach uh, is required. So uh, the agreement uh, will follow the new act. And, and this proposed amendment in front of you follows the new act also, but there was further things still in discussion with ATS. We were trying to move things ahead because of the new uh, statute took effect already July 1. And whenever this agreement is signed, it will be retroactive back to July 1. So I guess my question to you would be, are you comfortable with this uh, going ahead uh, to the uh, council agenda that's this coming Tuesday, or do you want it to reappear again at a committee of the whole meeting? What's the pleasure of the council? I, I would ask for the committee of the whole just because there's a few. Uh, I would like to look into a little bit more. There's some issues. I was watching the Common Commission channel the other day, and I saw how they were going to try to redirect some of the monies uh, through there. Um, and so I wanted to find out what they're doing and, and seeing how that's going to affect us. Uh, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that we're not losing any monies through any other entities that might want to try to take a piece. Uh, no, the County guess, Commission uh, did not touch any of our red light camera revenue. Well, there was mention about it, so like I said, I would like to look into it. Thank you. Okay. So, so that, if, uh, if we could uh, move to the four. to okay. the county of a whole. So you want to defer it? Motion to defer. May I have a question? Yes, Ms. Lovins. I just recalled an ordinance that our, um, we passed as a council last year to join the city of Weston in a lawsuit that Y. Sirota was spearheading. Um, just because I haven't read anything about it. How does this affect that lawsuit that we joined with the city of Weston? Uh, that doesn't have anything to do with this, with this subject matter. That dealt with that uh, growth management legislation. Oh. So it doesn't have anything to do with this. Thank you. Thank that you, subject's confused. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Further questions before we... Is there a motion to, to defer? We have a motion. Uh, is there anything time, uh, yes. Yes. Is there anything time sensitive uh, as far as we get this going? Uh, and, uh, right. We would, prefer, the or? we would prefer to have been able to move it ahead and get it finalized uh, because July 1, the new statute took effect. Uh, one possibility would be to leave it on the agenda for this coming uh, I would uh, prefer that. Monday, uh, which is, uh, you know, where it's uh, been placed on the agenda, which I believe is uh, July, uh, what is that, July 19th. 
Yeah. Leave it on for that agenda. That's and, a discussion if, item. and if the council members are do not you, comfortable you, at that time, it could be further deferred. Do you feel confident that you'll have the language between us and them worked out by Thursday so it would be able to be included in the agenda package? <laughs> I'd hate to get that right at the last moment, which I see it because of the time frame. That was, that was going to be my concern why I asked for it to be in the committee of a whole so that they would have enough time to get it to us and we could review it properly and then be able to, to, to discuss the issue. What, what happens whenever we make a decision like this is that they're going to get to work on it right away. They're going to bring it to us. We get it at the last moment, and we didn't read it. That's going to be my only concern. I just want to put that for the record. Well, I'll make a motion to bring it forward next Monday. I'll second. Okay. We have a motion to bring it forward next Monday and a second. All in favor? Uh, Mayor. Yes. It, it wouldn't. It wouldn't matter because if we pass it tonight, it's going to yeah, be brought gonna forward. It's going to be brought forward. So there's no need. So why don't we just we'll move just it? Just move it. It don't, it don't make any sense to. Because well, if well, we vote to let pass it, it's going forward to the consent yeah. agenda. Well, well, the consent agenda without discussion. But, but you can pull it. Pulling it and then I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's do this and let's just vote on it as it is right now and see if, it, if, it, if it's up or down. So, it was up. so is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. As long as David gets me the language. Nays. Nay. <laughs> okay. Motion carries. Next item. Um, thank you. Thank uh, you. Everybody. Utility committee. Um, design construction management of Canal C103 crossing at 152 Avenue. Motion. To move Motion. forward. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. Staff report. Um, yes, sir. Um, this is to execute, accept and execute uh, the proposal from CT3S um, for engineering services uh, in order to um, design and construct the uh, electrical conduits crossing the Canal C-103 uh, at uh, Southwest 152nd Avenue. Um, this is basically to improve the, in, in, increase the reliability of our grid uh, and to provide better ser services to the area. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if it gets too technical, I'm going to have to refer to our um, uh, director of electric utilities. Um, basically, it's just a conduit across the canal so that we can improve reliability of, the, of that grid, of that system. Okay, questions from council? No questions from council? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Nays? Motion carries. Okay, just for a little clarification before we go back to item B, um, it, it's just to keep kind of order, peace and order here on the dais. Um, it, I don't care if you call me Mr. Mayor, if you call me Mr. Bateman, if you say hey, but whatever, but before you speak, just make an acknowledgement with your finger and your voice so I can kind of keep a little order and keep people in order. Uh, sometimes you, I see a finger go up and then a voice starts on the other end. So I'm just trying to keep a nice even meeting, which I think we move, we move very well. I mean, I think this was a lot of items here that we went through very, fairly quickly so we could get to um, the real topic tonight. Anyway, so just uh, wh whichever you want to do, once you've made contact and I say yes, uh, Mr. Shelley, Mr. Maldonado, um, you just continue to talk. You don't need to go back to the chair uh, until you change individuals. Uh, you know, if you go from the manager to the department head, you know, then we'll ask, you know, you ask him again to go to another department, another person within the audience. But um, you don't have to continue through the chair, through the chair. It, it, I mean, I know the county does, and I know it sounds very flow, and, and, and the chair likes that. But just one acknowledgement is fine, and, and move forward. Mayor? Yes. Are you okay with me making noise down here? Because I know sometimes Councilman Shelley blocks my view and you can't see me. <laughs> Listen, when I, when I hear that mic flick on down there, the first thing I do is I look down. Trust me. I, my ears are tuned to that mic. <laughs> Have I ever missed you? Oh, that hurts. That hurts. Okay. Okay. Let's move back to, to the, the big topic of the night. Uh, continued discussion of Homestead Airport Zoning Ordinance. Uh, how would what's the pleasure? How would uh, we'd like to start this? You want to start uh, with the TDRs? Give you a quick uh, up, update uh, as to w what we have done. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. And then uh, maybe a recommendation as to how I uh, proceed that, that we should proceed and for your consideration. Um, uh, right after the meeting, uh, the direction, the general direction from you was to um, uh, twofold. 
to uh, have our attorneys craft a, a draft um, vested rights determination ordinance, uh, which they did and submitted to you by, by Monday. Uh, I, in turn, the direction to me was to um, elaborate on the definition and, and some of the history and, and so on uh, regarding transfer of development rights. And, and I also did so. I provided you some linkages, uh, web, website linkages uh, that, since that moment. And I also included a package um, for you, which actually defines pretty much uh, in a u very user-friendly uh, basis what transfer of development rights are and the different uh, purposes for which they are created. Um, and um, I'm also going to say that, you know, I'm also researching uh, some funding mechanisms by which the, um, there, we have, a, I know of some either federal or state grants that uh, because of the military safety concerns relative to this, to, to, to this ordinance uh, will fund some of the transfer, uh, the development rights. Uh, resulting out of, out of this um, ordinance should you adopt uh, a transfer of development rights ordinance. And I'm in the process of reviewing that. Um, I hope the information that, that I provided to you and I had the, the opportunity to speak with uh, most of you uh, regarding TDRs, I hope that information was useful. Um, I also uh, included, we also uh, submitted, uh, sent notifications to property owners um, and uh, provided uh, or uploaded a map outlining the affected areas on our website and um, uh, the ordinance itself as proposed and the um, and I believe uh, one, one other document uh, the map, the ordinance oh and, and a very brief description as to what TDRs were, uh, transfer of development rights uh, where I see the discussion going in, uh, going about today is, is um, going, elaborating a little bit more as to what uh, TDRs uh, as a solution to this issue uh, could represent and uh, also the, the issue of uh, the determination by this council of, of uh, vested rights. The, just so you know, I, I did uh, some uh, estimation of the impact in that general area, excluding the, the, the residential impact of the areas affected by APC1 and APC2, uh, exclusive of the uh, Homestead Park of Commerce because Homestead Park of Commerce is an industrial slash commercial type uh, area. I came up with about, I think the number was 906 acres. Uh, I took out about 20% um, of that, uh, which is typically in, uh, set aside for infrastructure. And the balance I calculated that the overall impact is a total of uh, 145 units based on the uh, current land use designation and, and the current zoning. So that's the overall impact within the APC 1 and 2 when it comes to residential impact. Now there are other factors that are involved, uh, other type of uses that may or may not be permitted within those areas and those will be subject to further, uh, you know, determination throughout, you know, if you so decide to move on with the, a transfer of development rights ordinance. Um, we'll have both discussions tonight, uh, but ultimately what I would recommend that you do is uh, give me the opportunity because I, what I see this going next and it's, it's a step that is, is, is needed, it's imminent at, at this point where we are after all the research that we've done is that we, all the parties sit at the same table and, and really hash out what every side is, is, is willing to, to live with and then come back to you to counsel and, and expose what, what, what that plan would be. 
That's that's an opportunity that I'm that I think it's we. That's the next step that I see us taking, uh, and and hopefully we'll we'll be able to do that uh, within the week's time or or you know when the soon. So having said that, that's basically an update. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be uh, happy to answer at this point. Um, we have everyone involved uh, here. Uh, although I don't see Colonel McCollum, but he, he's uh, well, uh, right he's hand well represented. people are there, so he's well represented. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Williams. Yeah, uh, through the chair. Yes, sir. <laughs> Whatever you please. Um, so you're saying we're just discussing the vested rights, or, or we're discussing the TDR? Or we, it's up to you, sir. Um, I think that the direction was for me to provide you that information, the attorneys as well. If you like, we can go a little bit in depth into either one or both, or, or those two. Uh, you have the option of hearing what they what they will you know, the direction that they would like to take. Uh, but I think that we are at the point, really, where we, and I mean staff and uh, the, the Air Force, the property owners, uh, uh, whether it's the Algiers or any of the other uh, area, uh, property owners in the affected area, uh, should sit at the table and hatch out what, what what their needs are, what they what they would be willing to work with, what they would not accept or not accept, and hopefully come out with a with a plan that is acceptable to all. There's going to be some give and take. Uh, they all need to know that you know coming in onto that, sitting down at that table, you're not gonna you know somebody's going to have to be be able to give a little you know, bit, give a little to take a little. And everybody has to come into to that table with that mindset, and and then I'll come back to you, uh, hopefully with a with a more cohesive approach to this whole issue. Oh, so then, while we're talking about it tonight, I guess is what my question is: If you've already proposed, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if if you've given us all of this great layout work, yeah, then uh, I suggest that you. Uh, Bring back to, I guess you're going to be doing the hashing uh, or the art of compromising. Um, then, then us sitting here tonight is not going to accomplish what you have envisioned or just said to us. Maybe I just missed it, you know. But I don't see the purpose of us sitting here mm -hmm. and you're saying that they've not worked out the issues yet. Uh, to what approach? Now, what I, do, what my understanding of tonight was to talk about the vested rights piece and then uh, to bring that up to the parallel with the ordinance that's already on the on the table so talking about the TDR tonight or the vested rights what is that places was was that place us in a position tonight because I just think we talked about it just a few days ago so are you making the recommendation that you want more time to do some more work with them or what is it? Because you, I don't get it. My recommendation is that you give me more time to work with them, to sit at the same table and work out a solution that hopefully will be uh, amenable to all of them before uh, coming back to you. Alex. Mr. Burgess. Well, I would just like to go back you know, through the chair to the, to the manager. This funding mechanism. I know that you had a meeting this afternoon, and we discussed it this morning prior to your meeting. Um, and, I, and I know that, and I think that that would take care of one of, one of the headaches that's presented to mm -hmm. us through this whole process that we've been going through. I was wondering what, that, what your meeting brought about this afternoon, and, and I don't know if you've shared any of that with anybody else, but... Uh, Maybe, you know, that, because I, sh I think that will shed a lot of light on what where, where our next move needs to go also, in my own eyes. The, the, the conversation this afternoon was about, like you mentioned, sir, uh, the potential funding mechanism, grant sources that could pay for yes. these development rights. Uh, and there are 
state funded and, and federal funded, uh, federally funded. Uh, state funded, we have the Florida Forever Grant, uh, and there is uh, another grant at the state level. Uh, I don't recall the name right now, but there is there is one uh, that that pays for this development rights. Um, my concern in my in, in my conversation uh, this afternoon was that you know and we were all uh, we went to the state and we went to Washington seeking grants mm -hmm. and and seeking different types of funding and we found that you know those those sources were completely dried out uh, in my conversation I found out that there are uh, in the case of Florida Forever Grant, for example, there's a balance available of, uh, I believe it's in, in, in the range of $2.1 billion still available to, to fund projects like this. And that while if I had made an application as a municipality to the state uh, to purchase land that was probably um, uh, protect somehow protected, whether it was a wetland or something like that, or, what, or whether it was park uh, land that was uh, to be acquired for a park. My application would will fall under a different category, whereas if I had applied for a, this same source, uh, grant source to to pay for transfer of development rights because of a, a military installation locating within, with, you know, in this area, then my, my chances of getting that grant went from zero to 100. I mean, uh, my chances were much greater. So these are things that I still need to, this was just conversation. If I feel optimistic that that's, that, that's a good avenue that we can take, one that would be provide a win-win to uh, all of us, uh, both, every side. And, and that's something that, I, again, I will continue to research and, and I hope to have a better, more complete information for you uh, in the near future. Um, that, what that means is that whatever the difference is in that development, right, the government will pay, whether state or federal, will pay the rights for that. And as a city, you can preserve those rights, use them or sell them or not do anything with them. So it's up to, it's your prerogative at that point. So that's, that's how that conversation went and, um, uh, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I think that both sides, uh, whether the ones seeking for a vested right or whether the ones seeking for a tra transfer of development rights, there's workable solutions. Uh, we just need to all sit down instead of uh, from the podium. Uh, maybe the best for forum is, uh, you know, at a round table where everybody can say to the one in front of you know, and, and, and I seek your direction there. If you want to participate, or one of you, it's up to, you know, it's your, your decision. Let me ask you, if, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I guess my thought is through the chair to one of the gentlemen from the Air Force, if one of those guys, whoever. I've never heard it asked up here, and, I, and, and maybe there's not, but I'm, I'm sure at some point through all these air bases being built, ACUS is being done in the country, that there was some sort of mechanism where the Air Force Base would, would, would have money. And I understand today's times are much different than in the past. But is there a fund that we can go to to help, to help us? I mean, I've never heard anybody ask them directly. I mean, I've asked them out on the side and they say, ah, you know, the government's broke, blah, 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 blah. But are there any kind of funds that we can rely on or go to, ask for, that you guys have asked for and been denied or anything like that? Major Mike Hatton, the statute advocate for Homestead Reserve Base, a new face. Colonel McCauley sends his apologies for not being able to make it tonight. Um, Councilman Burgess, the short answer is no. Um, we are currently in the process of trying to get money just to acquire easements uh, in and around the clear zones and the APZs. We can't even get money to do that. And that would be for us to actually acquire an interest in land. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly, uh, again, guys. Based on my knowledge, uh, there's no money out there the Air Force has set aside for these TDR-type programs. 
Okay. I mean, I've never heard it asked directly, too, you know, in back rooms, but I just wanted to get that on the record, too, because people had asked me about that, too. So thank you. Right. Let me just thank, thank you, sir. Yeah, let me just briefly ask you, if, if we're talking about setting down another meeting, Mr. Manager, I thought it was time certain. I thought this was time certain for the military, and they asked us not to delay, regardless of how we voted. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I mean, at this point, the Air Force would not be in favor of more meetings. I mean, at this point tonight, we're at, what, 24, 25 meetings on this issue. Uh, I think, for the most part, all the parties have had their chance to say their piece on multiple occasions within the last couple of months. Uh, so I don't really, I honestly, I don't see what benefit we would gain from another meeting to discuss the same issues we've been working over the last three or four meetings we've had on this issue. Mr. Shelley. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> That's what I was going to raise is kind of get some clarity as far as where we're going. And again, I have no, no objection to what the city manager has proposed, but that's something I've advocated from day one is that why force the decision on us when we have to make this tough decision when you can sit with the military, the military can sit with the, the landowners, can sit with the, the park of commerce people and maybe find some sort of middle ground that you guys can work out that we have to pick one side or another. And, and I, so I, I advocate for that. However, I also don't want to see this thing delayed. I do know it's a, it's a time crunch for the military. So I don't, what I'm trying to do is maybe see if there's direction from council to go ahead and move this draft ordinance or bring a draft ordinance for this vested rights procedure to us at the next council meeting. That'll be on first reading. We can pass it or change it. Then everything's on first reading. In the meantime, you guys are having these meetings. You guys are having these negotiations, which I think is a very good thing. And then at some point, we hopefully can either modify one of the ordinances and have a second reading and everything stays right on track but at the same time we have all these meetings going on so that's the direction that I would like to see um, so I, I put it out there for the rest of the council to try to get some clarity to staff to give us a direction so that we're not kind of waffling around no, no, I, I, I concur um, I think that that can happen up to the 19th our council meetings on the 19th I think you ought to try to have one two three meetings because I think that there are some property owners out there who felt like they didn't get a say so if we continue to reach out to those property owners, the ones who have not yet been to the table, uh, then I think we, we did our job. So if you'll continue to reach out, as I asked at the last meeting, yes, that, that no longer do we do uh, a, a newspaper publication, but we, we do... We'll continue it. doing that, but in That's addition good. to that... That's Direct mail. We, we will do the additional steps, take the additional steps to Thank notify you. people. Thank you. So I'm, I'm in. I'm in agreement. Well, the same thing. Yes. Uh, one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I you. Thank you, Councilman. I. My point is, you're going to sit down with them, and I understand talking it out. But in private, and, and when you have these meetings with the military, they're very clear about what they can't say in the public and what they'll never say that they can concede on because there's certain things within their study, there's certain things within the ordinance that they just won't say, okay, we're going to give way, you can exclude this, that they'll remain and they'll continue to um, request, for example, that the Park of Commerce be included mm -hmm. as part of the area that would be affected. And so um, I think, I don't know, I'm, I don't want to speak for the military, but one of the contentions, one of the points that we are going back and forth on is whether the Park of Commerce will be excluded or included. Depending on that is whether we go forward with this vested rights ordinance as I spoke to you about this afternoon. Aside from that is the TR, uh, TBR program, which I am now after meeting with you, I understand it and is much more complicated and very extent, much more extensive than what was presented at the last workshop. I thought it was just a procedure that we established, but there's all sorts of decisions that we have to make once we reach the point of forming that kind of program. Um, and there's only one way that I would support, that I see it feasible, and I'll say it in the public for the record that I told you in private, is that we would establish some kind of land, um, some kind of development rights bank, seek public funding, and to that end, I requested that you'd be very specific when you come before council, when you provide me with information as to the name of the funding sources that are available, the amount of money, because I want to know whether we're talking in realistic terms or not. Sorry. One of the um, things that you provided to us, a paper about um, these development right programs and the feasibility of it, one of the challenges that is said in there was that there was limited amount of money and that every year you go by there's even less, less, and less. So we can't talk about public funding if it's realistically not available to the city of Homestead. Mm -hmm. And because it's going to be such an extensive procedure, I don't want to go down that road if we're not going to be able to fund it. 
That said, just I would request going – the information you provided was great. The – I was able to read it and very thoroughly understand this. Going forward, if you can just be very specific, not in vague terms. This is something very extensive that we're talking about, very detailed, affecting a lot of different people, and we need to speak in detailed terms. Thank you. Mayor? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Williams. Mayor, I thank – to the Chair. The problem that I see is that we're talking about a TDR, and I don't know if we are – if we are able at this moment to do that in the realistic time that this ordinance need to be passed. The only reason why I brought it up the other day or the other night was simply because it was listed in the military study and thought that might be a probable cause to go into detail. So the military has already endorsed the program in their study as one of the – something that they can amend to. I don't know if going back to the table will accomplish their ideas or what they have already put out in their study in the JLUs, and I just don't see – I think where the problem may come in is that the property owners probably need to come together, but I think the military is already stuck on where they are, so I don't know if there's any compromise to where they are already. You know, so I don't know by delaying this or more meetings will accomplish that. And then I go back to the first question, my first comment. When I first – what is in the best interest of the city of Homestead? What is in the best interest? So I don't want to get off base with trying to find grant money to fund a TDR when that can't be realistic within the next couple of months. I don't – so I kind of see us going off base a little bit and away from the true issue, and that's the ordinance. And I think we need to stay put on what the ordinance is and work off that. Mr. Manager. If I may, my intention was not to delay it. It was to still go for the, you know, 19th, the meeting that we have scheduled. My intention was to have that meeting, that sit down before that point so that I can, you know, at least make another attempt to really sit down with all the parties involved and hopefully hash this out before I come back to you with, you know, hopefully a recommendation that everybody agrees to. You may end up coming back to us with a recommendation either or, and we vote. We just – we do what we're elected to do. We vote, you know, our conscience. Simple as that. Any further things from counsel before we go to the public? Yes, Mr. Mulvaney. Okay. I keep hearing the time issue here. And according to what we spoke to last time, the TDR, from what we spoke, took months in order to figure out. And so it needs to be time to work that out. And here we're discussing that this is a time-sensitive matter. So I would like to direct my question to the military personnel that's here. I've heard time sensitivity, but I've never heard the explanation of the time sensitivity. I mean, you know, I keep hearing it's time sensitive, but my question is what is the time sensitive matter? And the reason why I say that is due to the fact that when we were here discussing last time, we hear already that this is going to be something that's going to be across the board in the next two years, the next two years that every base that is active is going to have to meet the same standards. So there's a two-year window still that would be met. So, again, I guess my question would be what is the time sensitive matter in detail so that we can understand what is time sensitivity? I think time sensitivity comes down to a couple of issues. One, we're talking, what, two or three years now this has been going on, so at some point a decision needs to be made. And we can keep kicking the can down the road six months, a year, 18 months from now in terms of other issues, but, I mean, at some point we need to make a decision. In terms of base personnel, I mean, as some of you may already know, Colonel McCauley is leaving. He is the base POC on this issue. He's gone in three weeks. So from the base's perspective, it's important that we try to get as much resolved before he leaves as possible because, I mean, he's been spearheading this effort since the very beginning. So those are really the two main reasons for the Air Force's perspective that we need to get this kind of decided and moved on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mulvaney. Thank you, Mr. Williams.
I guess my, my question would be to the fact that I was kind of led to believe in, and I don't want any decision that we make here impede any growth of our, our Air Force base, but so that would be my question. Is there something there that says, that says, you know, if we don't do this by this time, then we're going to have issues with our bases closing down. I mean, that's what I would say is time sensitive. Other than that, that I understand he's been working hard. And obviously, it's an important matter. But again, there's, there's, when you say time sensitive, and this is what, the, what we're discussing, what is the issue? And then, then we could decide on that issue, whether it's really time sensitive. Well, I can say that, uh, I mean, Colonel McCauley is obviously above my pay grade, so I'm not uh, privy to all the information that he has in terms of the base missions. Uh, I do know at this point there is no BRAC commission planned in the next year or two, uh, but th that does not mean that the Air Force is not constantly reevaluating missions and personnel decisions about sending people to Homestead. You know, I think you probably have heard the, the phrase Total Force Initiative. Uh, that's the uh, process of sending active duty personnel to Homestead to work with the reserve members uh, to operate our flying mission in joint with the active duty. Uh, I mean, those discussions are going on as we speak. Uh, so to what degree uh, the airway the district would impact those decisions, that's probably a decision best answered by someone who's not a major <laughs> in the Air Force. Mr. Mayor, could yes, I just Mr. Add, add a comment to, to piggyback on, on that? I think one of the things that is, is time sensitive left too is right now we're dealing with like three entities and, and some fam three large entities and some and some single family uh, families out there. It, it, the longer we continue to drag this on, A and H sells property, Speedway Commerce sells property, then we don't have as easy a time as to come to a consensus up here among among them either because if they sell off parcels that's just another person uh, possibly whatever route we take another lawsuit so you you know what however somebody would look at it so we could we're opening our can of worms every time we started with a snow cone three years ago when I sat down here I felt like I had a snow cone now I feel like I'm trying to tackle Frosty the snowman and I'm still losing ground up here every time we have one of these meetings so I would like to move on and I think that helps in the time sensitivity is that you um, not time sensitive as, as it has to be done today, but then it, the more people we involve, if they start selling off parcels of land out there, we're taking more steps backwards too. So I think that that's one point. Thank you, and I think that was my point earlier when I said bring it back to us either way. Um, can we open up to the public now? Is everybody through, real quick? Um, before Lally, before you speak, I, who, John Thompson? Is John Thompson? Okay. Um, Sir, please take the microphone. He gave me a written uh, request. Okay, you want to get it? He's very good. That's a gentleman right there. Go ahead. Good, e okay. good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Lila Batiste with the law firm of Holland and Knight, 701 Brickell Avenue in Miami. I'm here this evening on behalf of a &H Commerce Park, which owns approximately 100 acres in the Homestead Park of Commerce. I'm joined this evening by two principals of a &H, uh, Mr. Jean Garcia and Mr. Bill Albernos, as well as Ernesto Casal of Capital Co uh, Commercial Group, the broker for a &H's parcel. My comments tonight are really in response to the vested rights ordinance that was drafted um, by the city attorney in response to last week's workshop. As most of you already know, A and H purchased the property from the city, its property from the city in 2007, in response to an RFP. At that time, the city accepted A and H's proposal to develop the property with approximately 953,000 square feet of light industrial use and 550,000 square feet of office and convenience retail use. The proposed development was accepted by the city and based on the city's comprehensive plan as well as the Rockefeller Master Plan. Those two um, documents were integral parts of the purchase and sale agreement between A&H and the city. And but for the representations made by the cities um, and the actions of the city in connection with the RFP, A&H would not have proceeded to purchase the 100 acres for 17 and a half million dollars and nor would it have expended over six hundred and fifty thousand dollars in legal and consulting fees um, approximately three hundred and forty four thousand dollars in wetland mitigation fees and approximately two million dollars in hard development cost 
I cite these monetary figures because they provide a very sound basis for A&H's vested rights argument. The legal standard for which is very clear. To establish vested rights, a property owner must demonstrate a good faith reliance upon an act or mission of a government and a substantial change in position or the existence of such extensive obligations such that it would be highly inequitable to deny the requested relief. I believe that the city is well aware of A&H's vested rights position, considering that the first draft of the ordinance specifically exempted the Park of Commerce. I presume that in order to address the concerns of the various stakeholders, the city council proposed a separate vested rights procedure in lieu of the exemption of the Park of Commerce and thought it would be sufficient. Well, it's not. It is legally insufficient in that it does not provide any assurance to A&H or other property owners that A&H's property rights will be respected through the vested rights process. Under the current scheme, and this is the draft that was presented by the city attorney this morning or Friday, once the airport zoning is adopted, A&H would be stripped of its right to develop the property in accordance with the proposal accepted by the city under the RFP. And not until seven months after the ordinance is adopted would they even be entitled to a hearing for determination of the vested rights. And with all due respect, the vested rights determination is made by this council, which has already demonstrated an unwillingness to acknowledge A&H's vested rights by removing that exemption from the ordinance. Presumably the base and the other stakeholders are not going away, so that at the vested rights hearing some seven or eight months from now, A&H's property rights are likely to be subject to the same political considerations that are present today. The only proper way to address the issue of vested rights for a property that's within the Park of Commerce, and that's not just A&H's, is to include the vested rights determination or finding as part of the airport zoning ordinance. Respectfully, we are unable to accept anything short of that. Unless the vested rights issue is appropriately addressed in the airport zoning ordinance, we'd request that the second reading of the ordinance be deferred. With respect to the property owners within APZ1, based on my discussions with the representative for the Algiers, I proposed to the city manager this morning via email that the city consider an arrangement where they would simply shift the density that would be impacted by the airport ordinance to other property that those property owners would own, to other property that those property owners own within the city of Homestead. Given that there are only a small number of property owners within APZ1, I don't think that this is unrealistic, and it really may be a viable option for the city to consider. That said, the issue of TDRs is a totally separate issue from the issue of vested rights. The situation for those property owners within APZ1 is very different from the situation of the property owners within the Park of Commerce. Again, I just respectfully request that the city defer the second reading of the ordinance unless the vested rights issue is appropriately addressed for those properties within the Park of Commerce. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, John Thompson at 3081 Salcedo Street in Coral Gables. I'm the General Counsel and member of Silver Arrow Land Company that's purchased 14 acres within the Homestead Park of Commerce. So essentially, you know why I let Lita go first, because she spoke so well. And we're in pretty much the same position because we are also property owners within the same area of development. We talk about vested rights, and I keep saying this new ordinance determining vested rights, how's it going to affect us? If you're going to down zone us, down zone our use, whatever you're going to do, 
if you include the Homestead Park of Commerce in your new ordinance, then you've already made a determination that we have lost rights. And so we have to then go and make an application to this same body and say, well, guys, you made a mistake and you shouldn't have taken those rights away from us. Are you going to do that, admit a mistake? I think not. And so I think we're heading on a collision course, and I hate to always mention litigation because it's a sensitive area, but there's no question about the fact that the sum total of what you're doing is going to be a violation of the Civil Rights Act, Section 1983, and there will be litigation on that for all property owners that you've taken rights away from, especially us because, like my previous speaker, we have a contractual right. It's not a vested right under common law. It's a contractual right under existing law that says that you're not going to amend the Homestead Park of Commerce and change our uses that we negotiated in good faith and that you enticed us into buying this property by entering into this contract with us and saying that we can develop this property the way you've told us we can do. So when you change those rights, you're taking something away from us, and that's where we get into the Civil Rights Act. I was kind of cheered that a council member was bringing up where's the Air Force in coming up with money to pay for the rights that they're taking away from your citizens. Why are they making the city stand up and do this and take the heat and take the damages and pay for it when it's to help the Air Force get through a problem of having an area of landing and takeoff that increases danger risk to people within their zone that they come up with? Should they not then, if they want to limit that risk and limit that development, pay us for it? Why should they ask the citizens of Homestead to pay for it? It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I think you're moving in the right direction. The thing that probably affects us, at least in our development of 14 acres the most, and it's just a portion of it, is the number of people per acre being limited the way that you suggested. That severely limits what we can do, and that's where we have the biggest problem. If that could be resolved, I think that would go a long way. So what I'd like to also point out is that the Rockefeller master plan cannot be amended except by the city manager at the request of a property owner that wants to have some changes and some amendments and some modifications. It said that right in the instrument itself. It's only going to be amended and modified in a way which may be requested by the developer in the future. Now, if you're going to take our rights away with this new ordinance, I go back to an old legal maxim that I learned 51 years ago or so in law school, and that is you can't do indirectly what you can't do directly. So if you're stuck with the Homestead Park of Commerce and its present uses that are authorized, you can't take it away indirectly by another ordinance. I submit that's where we're going to have a clash that's going to result in verdicts and judgments in favor of the landowners. Thank you, sir. I just say to you I wouldn't count the votes just yet. I'd just sit back and let's see how it goes. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Amanda Quirk on behalf of the Alger family. We've spoken a few times, and our position is still the same. They've owned this property since the 1950s. They participated in the JLUS for a few years, upon which other alternatives were talked about in exchange for restrictions on the property in the APZ-1, including transferable development rights or the property can be purchased. But as the ordinance stands, the day that it's passed, they will be adversely affected by the deprivation of these rights. I think that we've heard throughout these meetings that there is no 
opposition from the base or from other property owners to these alternative solutions. The only factor is time. And we respectfully request that you put yourself in their shoes. They own 250 acres in the APZ-1. They own 150 acres in the APZ-2. And they're sitting here very concerned about what's going to happen if this ordinance passes the way, the way it is on second reading. The only thing we're asking for is time. You haven't heard any opposition to any of these proposals. And uh, we would like to sit down with the city manager and, and the base and agree upon some details of how those rights might be able to be transferred in a very simplistic manner. But um, the bottom line is all we need is just a little bit of time. I know that the, um, the base has said that they've been working on this for a few years. You know, Carla personally participated in the JLUS. Um, and we were re-involved in this ordinance only a few weeks ago because we were not aware that a formal ordinance was coming forward that was any, in any way, shape, or form different from what was proposed at the JLUS. So um, with all due respect to the base, um, we, we respectfully request just that the city take the time to balance the interests of the base with the private property owners. That's the only thing that, um, that I think you're hearing tonight. Thank you. I think that's what we're all saying. I think that's what's going to happen up until the 19th. Uh, I encourage you to get involved with the manager in his meetings, and I assure you on the 19th we will vote uh, up or down, left or right, however, you know, what, what's brought to us here. Mr. Porter. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Come. Do it through the chair again? Yes, please. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Jeff Porter, uh, Chairman of the Military Affairs Committee. Um, I, I kind of agree with the direction everybody's going. This is going to be a broken record the longer that we continue the, uh, the dialogue because the message is, is basically consistently the same uh, depending upon who speaks at the microphone. Um, you know, my task is as the, as the Chairman of the Military Affairs Committee to speak on behalf of what the military cannot say or will not say. Um, I think it's been clear from day one that it's been about safety. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of questions about vested rights that seems to be bouncing around a lot. And there's a lot of questions about TDRs. And I agree. I agree with the gentleman that there, there shouldn't be the responsibility of the homestead residents and this council to pay for um, a transfer right that is ultimately going to be the responsibility of the federal government. You don't have a printing press in the basement. They do. So um, there's, there's a, a little bit of a, of a problem there. My concern with, is with, with regards to the vested rights question. That is obviously a legal question. And to, to forego that legal uh, battle, if you want to call it, and give someone vested rights prior to finding out if they truly do have a vested rights argument, because I can tell you I have a vested right, but I may not. So the, the question would be if there's going to be some legal challenge uh, to, to a vested rights question, it should be answered someplace else rather than a political forum at the expense of uh, maybe the health and safety and welfare of the, of the citizens of, the, of this town and this community if you build or allow by vested rights to put something in that could be a detriment to the community. I think that's where this has to um, ultimately go. Uh, it's a tough situation, and, and uh, unfortunately, it's on your laps as, as the current council. It has been uh, batted around for a very, very long time. But prior to um, the ordinance giving someone a vested rights, without really any clarity as to whether there is a true vested right other than um, a, a threat of some sort of a legal question being thrown out, maybe you need to throw it to the legal eagles to discuss that vested right question. So... Um, with that, Mayor, Council, I, I appreciate your time. I'm, you know, sensitive to everyone's issues, and, and I'm very sensitive to yours. But this is this is a, really a legal question that um, that vested rights, and that's my discussion as pertains to the Parker Commerce. That's my my from my board as as the chairman of the of the Military Affairs. We're specific to the Parker Commerce. We're specific to the question of keeping that in. If you give vested rights to the Park of Commerce prior to the ordinance being adopted, you might as well exempt the Park of Commerce from the ordinance because you're giving it vested rights already. Okay. As to the other uh, property owners, um, we're not there. We're not in that discussion. So uh, I appreciate your consideration, and, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good evening. I agree with what uh, Mr. Porter has said. The issue of vested rights should be determined prior to. It is a legal issue, and it should be um, 
vetted and recognized prior to the adoption of the airport ordinance. That's exactly, we agree with that position. Thank you. And incorporated into the ordinance. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Councilwoman. My name is John Carter, owner of DK Land Holdings, Homestead, Florida, 132 Northwest 18th Street. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the ordinance. And there is a form for us to follow out there, Jacksonville Ordinance, which I supplied to the city today. We do have some good recommendations in there based on the language that we have in this ordinance. I do want to go on the record to say I want to see this ordinance pass. I just want to see it pass with the correct format that would be applicable to everybody involved. In the ordinance, which is different in our Homestead Ordinance than what we have in Jacksonville, is that we're making recommendations on the vested rights. When the discussion in the 2007 Julius studied all the aspects of landowners, sovereignty, and how to benefit both base and the landowners, the 17-member committee, after considerable research from the EDAW, who consulted and wrote the JLUs, recommended TDRs over all the tools available. They did that because when they went into the actual copy of the Air Joint Land Use Study, they actually created a value for the TDRs, which is saying that they're no less than $25,000 per credit. So they're creating that vested interest in a credit amount there. I do believe with the ramifications outside of what we're doing with the property in this ordinance, by the considerations of people per square unit or square acre, in that they've approached that from the Jacksonville Ordinance. They came with a remedy on that that works for this ordinance. And I think with some recommended rewording, and by taking a look at that model that's already in place since 2006, that it would remedy the situation here. Because it does say in that the structured APZ2 structures are non-industrial or non-manufacturing, would be conducted or limited to 5,000 square feet, which would exempt the process that we're talking about here with the landowners that would already be in the foreign trade zone. That would allow them to be able to bring in the kind of manufacturing or the kind of without those limitations. Because, I mean, when it comes down to the end of the day, who's going to want to come down or relocate from Western Broward, Hialeah, come down to Homestead and buy that same amount of land for the same usages and be restricted with 25 people or 50 people in a 20,000 square foot unit? We're not going to be able to bring that economic growth based on the pattern and the language that we put in here. I think if we take just a little more time and we look at this and we look at the Jacksonville Ordinance, I think that we can get our model tighter, get our ordinance to where it would be feasible for everybody involved. Thanks for your time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Any further discussion? Public? We're going to bring this to a close, so come on up. He's coming up, Mr. Mayor. Could I just ask our city attorney, going back to Ms. Batiste's question, how long would it take to determine the vested rights, whether or not they had them? If we were to go through the full process, not being a legal person, I'm not even sure where to start with that, but I'm guessing it. Right. If I can answer that, Mayor, basically what would be normally envisioned would be a quasi-judicial type hearing where the person claiming the vested rights has the burden of proving that they meet the elements of vested rights, and ultimately it would be up to the decision of the city council to determine whether or not those criteria are met and vested rights are established. If vested rights are established, then someone would be able to proceed as if the new regulations did not exist. Ms. Batiste, just a clarification. Is that the process that you were looking for? Are you looking for it to take it to the courts or somewhere else and get it? No, I'm looking for the city to acknowledge the vested rights prior to the airport ordinance taking effect so that the vested rights determination is included in the airport ordinance. Mayor, just to further respond, the approach that, and James White could address it much better than I can, but James has prepared a draft ordinance that would set up a procedure for determining whether or not vested rights exist. 
once that ordinance is adopted, then a quasi-judicial proceeding would be held. Right now, there is not a procedure adopted. There is not these ordinance criteria spelled out to determine whether or not there are vested rights. I don't know if you wanted to add to that, James. The, uh, uh, the way the proposed ordinance is drafted is uh, once an ordinance, uh, any amendment to the Code of Ordinances is uh, <clears throat> city-sponsored amendment is adopted by you all, an applicant has 90 days uh, to apply for and avail themselves um, of a vested rights determination. Um, so there's only that window of 90 days. You can extend that out if you'd like. I just started with 90 days. It's a three-month time period in which someone has to come in and apply uh, and avail themselves of a vested rights determination. Um, and then you all, once you receive the application, uh, have to act within 120 days. I mean, that could be a very fast process. We could shorten that time frame up, but that time frame is completely up to you. But it's not a very long process for someone to avail themselves of a vested right. Um, with this particular ordinance, even if it ran concurrent with the uh, proposed uh, airport zoning ordinance, there will be a lag time with regard to when the airport zoning ordinance is adopted. That's assuming you ex assuming you include everybody in. Um, when the airport zoning ordinance is adopted, um, and then right away, the applicant would be able to come in and avail themselves. But there would certainly be a, a, a lag time uh, where uh, their rights would not be realized. But no one's building right now, but the argument that you've heard from the applicant is that it impedes sales or it impedes financing. Um, so the longer you, draw, you drag it out, it's not beneficial for them. James, let me ask you this. Um, the majority of this council was not here when this property, this particular issue, not the Alger issue, but this particular issue, we were not here. Did White Sweat and Healthman not handle the closing and the sale of the property from the city to the, these people? We were involved. I'm asking you yes. a common sense question. Didn't I, you know, get real technical. Didn't you think they were buying it to do something with it? Didn't they have vested rights and they come to the table with the money and say, we're buying this because we think we're, we may in the future do X and I might do Y and I might do Z? So why are we acting now like they don't have vested rights? I don't get it. Just help me clear it. I, clear I, I can't answer that question for you. I mean, I don't agree on why. Stuff. Personally, I, I, I think it, it's either clear or it's not when you sold it to them. I mean, it, we're not talking years that they sat on it. We're talking one year. It's not like they sat around and did nothing with it. See, you got to help me here a little bit. Both attorneys. Wh wh right. I, I guess basically, Mayor, I guess basically the answer is that when people buy property, <clears throat> they buy it uh, subject to the existing laws, but also there's a certain risk that the laws and the zoning may change. And that's why, for example, there's a statute in Chapter 163 where you could have a development agreement where you could lock in existing zoning. Uh, like we've seen, for example, uh, certain properties up in Aventura uh, where they were developed pursuant to a development agreement that basically freezes time. Uh, that's chapter 163, I forgot the decimal point, but that's a special unique proceeding because normally in the absence of vested rights, people <coughs> run the risk that zoning will change, laws will change. And that's why that special statute on development agreements was created where, where a developer could uh, you know, have a special ordinance adopted uh, on property and uh, allow that to lock in existing zoning. So people do uh, buy things. Uh, sometimes they assume they can do certain things, but there is a certain risk that laws will change. But ultimately, you all, as the policymaker, you will decide what's the right thing to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. as you said, when you come to these uh, hearings, you'll either vote a thing up or down and balancing all the interests. Thank you. I, I, I agree with you. And you said time. Things do change over time. But we're not talking really about any amount of time. I mean, what they bought it a year ago for, I'm sure they have the same intentions, pretty much the same as today, a year later. If had it been 10 years, I guess I can buy that. But I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Good answer. Yes, uh, Lila, did I answer your question? <laughs> You're walking away. No. Um, you, my question was answered, or my comment was addressed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Podium's yours. Thank you for 
let me go off on that. Good evening, Mayor. Common sense thing. Council members, my name is Ernesto Casal. I represent the E&H portion at Park of Commerce. I think the decision that you guys are looking at has a severe impact. It's something that's going to severely impact this city for not just a year or two, but many decades potentially. So I want you to really consider about what's being proposed. I'm going to talk to you from a perspective of real life situations that I'm currently going through as I market this property. So I can tell you real life applications. Everybody talks about vested rights. Let me tell you about what's going on with potential people out there that are looking at the city of Homestead. It's obvious that any kind of restriction as this ordinance is proposed, it proposes a restriction that from a pure real estate standpoint, that automatically creates a devaluation of property. So anybody that's looking at the city of Homestead, they're going to look at that and say, there's a restriction on my property potentially, and it's going to affect my value now and in the future. So moving forward with that, as I've, in looking over some of the points of this ordinance, when you look at some of the restrictions as, for example, density, real life, when I talk about real life, you know, real life examples, the city, part of commerce has been under consideration by companies such as Delta Airlines, who wanted to put a call center back in 2000. They chose to stay in South Florida. Unfortunately, they moved to Miramar. Under this proposed ordinance, that call center, Delta Airlines would not have considered Homestead as an option. As of recent, when we were under contract to buy this property, Hyundai, a Korean company who wanted foreign trade zone status, who recently just completed a 300,000 square foot building in West State, that operation would not be able to be housed at this location because of this ordinance or this proposed ordinance, better yet said. There have been multiple government inquiries, government buildings, company buildings like the DEA that's currently built, and other potential government entities that would consider this location because we are a viable candidate for this. Under these proposed ordinances, in some instances, an ATF or any other government group that needs cheap land or somewhere where there's a high employment or any of that kind of ratio, this kind of ordinance would propose a major limitation would not be acceptable to these individuals or these groups. So these are real jobs. These are real things that represent tax dollars to the city, all the ancillary benefits of this from a retail component, from a housing component. I've grown up in South Florida all my life, and you're going through a major transition going from a farming community. And this is the Homestead part of commerce has been a focal point, I believe, for the city to take that next step. And so when you're looking at this ordinance, please consider some of the things I'm talking about. Even recently, as of last week, I spoke to a manufacturer. He would bring jobs to the city. He's a diaper manufacturer, local. Under this proposed ordinance, he would not be able to function due to the density clause potential. So when you consider this ordinance, please consider some of the things I've said tonight as far as some of these companies, some of these uses, the potential that Homestead part of commerce presents to the city of Homestead. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sure, please, Mr. Mayor. I agree. I mean, one of the things that I'd like to see is development of our park of commerce. But, you know, the thing we have to remember when we're discussing this is it does, it always comes back down to this, is there a vested right or not? Because we have, the park of commerce isn't just this 100 acres. I mean, that means a lot to you. I understand that because you have a vested interest in that, in the outcome of that 100 acres. But there's an additional 60 to 100 acres in that park of commerce that can still be fully developed. So we're not, by passing this ordinance, if we decide to do that or don't decide to do that, we're not killing commerce here in Homestead because there's still another 60 to 100 acres in that park of commerce that can be utilized, you know, for whatever, with no restrictions whatsoever. And then not too far from there, there's another couple hundred acres of commercial property that can be developed. So there's more than enough commercial property, you know. So we're not, I want to make that very clear. By passing this, we're not trying to kill commerce because that's not the case. You know, it comes down to strictly that this particular parcel of land, is there a vested right, is there not a vested right? And so for me, I want to see the process, though. You know, I don't agree 
with let's go ahead and just declare vested right. Let's determine that now before we pass the ordinance. I'm in favor of, you know, which I think everyone's kind of aware of, let's, let's, let's do the process. Let's pass the vested rights ordinance. Let's pass the ordinance, you know, include the Parker Commerce. And then you come back to me and you say, okay, do I do not have a vested right? And I'll make that determination at that time. Um, but I want to see the procedure. I want to make sure that it's done properly, and at the end of the day, the right result comes out. So I just want to make those two quick, quick points. The, the problem with that approach is that there is no – once the airport ordinance is adopted, the A&H and all the property owners that are affected lose their development rights. So that eight-month lag time or whatever is, is not a legally sufficient way to address this. One – possibility is that the airport ordinance doesn't take effect. Although adopted, it doesn't take effect until people go through the vested rights procedure. That's another way of um, addressing this issue and then still the property owners having the ability to seek redress in the event that the council comes up with the wrong vested rights decision. In your opinion. <laughs> You know, my name is William Albernaz. I'm one of the principals, and I'm a real estate attorney. Okay. And, of course, they said... You give us the address? For the uh, my address, 901 Ponds, Suite 603. Thank you. Coral Gables. And so every lawyer knows that a lawyer that represents himself is a fool for a client. Mm -hmm. So I'll be brief, but I'll tell you a little bedtime story. Uh, other than Sergio and uh, Wendy, uh, everybody here... Well, Sergio wasn't here. Wendy was here, and I think and, uh, that was it, I think, because... It, John. John Burgess. And Burgess, and John Burgess was here when we went through the process initially of trying to buy this property. We negotiated with Weiss Sirota. We came to the commission twice to buy the property. And uh, Mayor Dawson, uh, Rascal, said uh, it's got to go to an RFP. So after all the work that we had done, we went to an RFP. Lo and behold, we won the RFP in whatever five categories. Uh, we took another six months to do the contract. We finally closed. We have our lender in place. You know, we start the process of dealing with the Army Corps. Uh, it's been, what, three years later? Three years later, we're, we're about to be ready to actually deed the lots. And then a third party, having nothing to do with the city, comes and says, well, now we want to restrict your property. Well, guess what? This is America. They can't do that. Why Sirota took care of the RFP process. They're very familiar with the whole process. They're very familiar with the closing. So they cannot come now to the city and say, well, we don't know if you have vested rights. Well, you got to know that we have vested rights. We paid $17 million five for the property, and the city took our money. So, you know, the city really... We still got it. I know you do. Did you already spend it, though? No. <laughs> Uh, you put in your big, then you're going to give it back, right? <laughs> no. So, so I'm a little, I'm a little confused, and and I, and I tell Lila, Lila, what, what do I have to go to this meeting for? I don't understand. We own the Park of Commerce. I'm confused. We have vested rights. You know, we we bring Lila from Washington. We pay Lila. You know, and then we're talking about the same thing. And I tell Lila, but I had a dream. I thought we already owned it. You know. So you know, you know, it's getting to be a little bit irritating to say the least. Uh, and so. We're moving forward with our development, and all we got to say is what Lila said and what uh, Mr. Thompson said is, I hope you guys make the right decision because right. you're not going to leave us any other alternative but to litigate. Right, and, and, and if we don't, it's Lila's fault. It's all Lila's fault, and we're going to have to pay her, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I leave you that so you can dream tonight about the consequences uh, of this Air Force thing that to, I don't even fly on a plane anymore because of this thing, you know? I drive my car. <laughs> Right, thank you. So, oh, thank you. Excuse me. Uh, address again. We didn't get it. We didn't name and clerk. Oh, 901 Ponce de Leon. Okay, your name? Uh, William Albernaz. Al Albernaz. 603. So I'd really like to stop coming to these meetings and concentrate on the development of our property, if it is our property. I, I, if not, we'll take the money back. Right. right yeah. Thank you. Mayor? Yes. I just want to comment. I had a flashback right now, and, and it is true. When we were talking about the J. Lou's, coming before us and we were debating whether we were going to adopt it, recognize it, accept it. And here's the thing with us sitting here at the council and with me as a councilwoman is you speak on behalf of anything and you're either labeled against developer or against a military base and you really, and so you want to find a balance of words to try and address it. You really want to find a balance rather than just getting labeled on these extreme scenarios. And so 
I've been very careful in how I express myself during this airport ordinance workshop because the last time I said something and immediately I was anti-whatever it was that I was. Um, I agree with what the mayor said earlier. I think that we've all um, have pretty much reached a point as to whether we're going to exclude the Park of Commerce or we're going to include the Park of Commerce. And I think that it's going to get to a point, you know, regardless of what conversation you have, is everybody has very strong opinions as to what their rights are and what safety is. And so I, I wish you the best of luck, but I don't think anybody's <laughs> going to move or budge from what has been stated in the public. So we're going to vote, and we're going to vote to either include the Park of Commerce or to not include the Park of Commerce. And the reason why we went down the vested right ordinance path was because we thought that it was going to be a viable solution to try and reach some kind of compromise. And so the attorneys put together this vested right ordinance. It comes before us, and the very person that suggested it is now saying that it's not good enough. Right. And Mr. Porter said, we'll leave it to the attorneys. We did. We said we need a vested rights ordinance. Attorneys draft it up. They draft it up. And it's not good enough. So on that matter, you know, you rely on the attorneys to come up with something that addresses. We do want to come to a compromise, but it seems at this point that there isn't a vested rights ordinance good enough that unless we just say exclude the Park of Commerce, that we're not going to reach a compromise in that area. So I'm going to leave um, no disrespect to all the speakers that are coming now, and I will continue to read what the city manager put before us, and, you know, hopefully we can get somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Short, okay, yeah, John now. Thompson, what's more? Uh, yeah, just two comments. Uh, I share the same frustration. All the uh, property owners in the Homestead Park of Commerce essentially have the same contract. We're protected on, on the what we bought and the use that we can make of it. And you can't take part of the uh, park and say, well, that's out of the zone, so they, they can have all the development. But you guys that are within this zone, you can't have the development. It just isn't going to happen. Um, and you talk about the TDRs, I think I mentioned last week that there's a uh, hometown democracy amendment number four to the Florida Constitution on the ballot November 2nd, uh, which essentially will say uh, that uh, any uh, change of use or zoning that affects uh, the master plan or comprehensive plan of a city would have to be put to the electorate uh, for approval after your approval, and that's basically destroys the TDR uses because mm -hmm. no electorate is going to vote for more development in this state. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Last, Mr. Mr. Least, Mayor, please. could I just throw something out sure. there? Uh, not to interrupt. We, can't, we don't have a quorum. Be but he's, he's perfect. He's, he's a gentleman there. I think Ms. Batiste brought up a good point, and I've okay. asked the city okay. attorney if it's something that we could do, and I think it's something that maybe we should consider. And I think it might be a, a, a compromise point is that we, we, we could pass the ordinance with everything in place, but it wouldn't uh, take effect until everybody's had a chance to come forward for their vested rights. Um, I know that Colonel McCulley's not here, and Tyson Smith, the gentleman that you guys received most of your uh, uh, information and, and guidance from, both of those guys. But I, I don't know if that's something that you guys could take back and, and see if it's, or maybe you can answer. I don't, I'm not sure, you know, what, what your parameters are of, of, of being able to voice things like that. Um, we, we, we briefly discussed kind of the timing of how everything was going to work out. And practically speaking, I mean, if you adopt the ordinance and include the Park of Commerce, is what the, what the basis position obviously is, and then we, con we continue working on a vested rights provision statute, practically speaking, I mean, there's not going to be any harm to the landowners if we don't get the vested rights statute passed for a month or two months. Um, even if they were to file a suit in court, it's not going to get heard uh, while we're working on that vested rights statute. And even if it got heard that quickly, no judge is going to make a ruling knowing that the city of Homestead, you were working on a vested rights provision? Well, then why are we here then? Uh, so, I mean, the basis to kind of summarize our position, one, we're in favor of TDR rights, but we think that's completely separate from the overlay district uh, and shouldn't be tied to it in any way. Uh, so go ahead and adopt the overlay now. We continue working the TDR process, and if the city decides to approve it at some point in the future, we're all, all in favor of that. Uh, I would also recommend that we continue pushing forward the overlay. I mean, if you want to kind of get the overlay and the vested rights on the same timetable, then maybe on the 19th we do first reading of the vested rights statute, 
And then that gets us to where, I guess, sometime later in July or August, we'd be on the same time frame to do the vested rights statute and the overlay at the same time. Um, I do want to just correct something Mr. Thompson said. I mean, the Air Force is not forcing the city to do anything. I mean, local and state law requires the city to adopt the overlay, not the Air Force. Uh, and, and local jurisdiction recognized the value of Air Force bases to the local community. And that's what we're trying to do. I mean, Colonel McCauley has preached time and time again, safety and kind of maintaining the base to prevent BRAC. If we exclude the Park of Commerce, that runs completely contrary to public safety and to BRAC issues. Now, if they are successful in the vested rights process, then we're fine with that. I mean, we're not here to take away anyone's vested rights. I just want to make that clear. Uh, but the, the, the statute as written is a balance. I mean, if the Air Force had its way, we wouldn't have anything in APZ 1 or 2. It'd be desert out there. That's not realistic. I mean, the statute provides uh, all landowners in APZ 1, APZ 2 opportunities. It may not be what they, exactly what they hope for, but some residential, some commercial, agricultural, so we're not taking away anyone's right to make some profit from their land. Uh, but it's a balance. I mean, with all due respect, again, to the landowners, they keep talking about what we could do tomorrow or six months from now or a year from now. Well, that might happen or it might not. The Air Force Base is here. We know what we do. We bring in $250, $300 million a year. Uh, and if the Everybody District doesn't get passed, or if it does, with the Department of Commerce excluded, and we start seeing high-rise buildings go up for some reason and we lose the mission, then I mean, you've lost a known quantity versus betting on what's going to happen in the future. Uh, it's a balance. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, we're going to wrap it up. One more quick comment? Okay, quick. And that's it. First of all, as soon as I think it's passed, we can't sell our property. Right. And, and we're 30 days away from filing the plan and being able to close on our lots. So, I have a $14 million loan on this property. So, my question would be then, is the, Arm, is the Air Force going to pay my loan on a monthly basis? And are they going to pay us for all this delay? And then what about my profits? While somebody makes a determination of, of vested rights, I don't think so. That's not going to work for us. I hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, all the input. I think we need to go back. Uh, and we've got very little window of, of time here. So you pick your day now. Tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. When are you going to have your next meeting in the manager's uh, conference room and, and, and iron a few things out? And if you don't, you bring it back here on the 19th both ways and we voted up or down yes sir uh, my my goal is to have a meeting uh, sometime this week okay but let's let's go ahead and pick a date let's pick it now so we can tell these people I don't know your count how heavy your calendar is but if you got your pull out your little yes, blackberry there and, and let's pick something that we can uh, let, let them leave with you know um, to just start the ball rolling so you have the next one out there you, you, if you can have two in one week that's great. If you can't, you did your best. So we've had our share of meetings. It's probably going to be Thursday, Wednesday. I know. God bless. <laughs> But that's okay if they're on vacation. It's all right. It, it's, it's okay. We're going to have one or two more meetings, and we're coming to a vote on, on, on Monday night. Well, we're not going to prolong it any longer. Monday, Monday, ninth and nineteenth, it, it, it's 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 going to get whatever you, you know, one way there. Sure. I I just think it's it's important to have a date and time because there are landowners involved. That I keep hearing have not been contacted, have not had a chance to say their piece. So by having another meeting time, if one of you show up or if twenty of you show up, I did my part. Um, you have a uh, special call on the um, on Thursday. They moved to Friday. It was moved. Mm -hmm. 
then at three o'clock on Thursday. Thursday. Special calls Thursday. Uh, three, three, uh, three o'clock on Thursday. This Thursday? This Thursday. Okay. <clears throat> that would be July 15th. Further discussion? Hopefully, you know, you guys can come to some kind of terms because we're going to vote it up or down, uh, you know, Monday night. I think it should come prepared both ways, and you see what happens. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. With that said, I'm sorry. Thursday at three o'clock. Thursday at three o'clock. Thursday at three o'clock. Thursday at three o'clock. City Manager's Conference Room. Okay. This coming Thursday. Fifteen. We're voting Monday. Okay. Uh, it's a public meeting. Do you have to? You need forty-eight hours to. Yeah. Well, then let's have it as as just a land, you know, private meeting then. <laughs> Let them have it. Can you have the meeting without noticing it? Can you have the public meeting? Can you have it? Uh, it's just a manager. It's not uh, any it's council, not council members. No. So it's no notice required. It's just manager. A manager, manager meeting with interested persons. Thank you very much. All right, with that said, uh, motion to, to, to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you.